Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Designing Your Life, Using Design Thinking Principles to Build a Joyful Life with Sarah Wojnicki and Katie Selby. My name is Rebecca Lubert. I am the Director of Career and Business Engagement with the University of Minnesota Alumni Association. Welcome and we appreciate your, your participation today. Before we get started, Before we get started, I have a couple announcements. Initiatives like the alumni webinar series are made possible by our alumni association members. So you, if you are a member, thank you. And if you're interested in becoming a member of the alumni association and supporting our work, check us out at umnalumni.org membership. Also have a few announcements. February is career month. Um, thank you to our presenting sponsor, Freedom Financial. As you can see, we have a few upcoming webinars that we hope that you can participate in. One that I'd like to call your attention to is happening this Thursday, February 20th, Minnesota Labor Market Trends. Please join us at that webinar. We also have a number of in-person workshops and networking events that you may be interested in. One of those networking events is called Minnesota Career Connections, which is an opportunity for all professionals across all industry, industries to network in person. That's February 26th from 5 to 7 p.m. at McNamara. Please join us. All right, so we also have an upcoming workshop with our presenters, Sarah Wojnicki smith and Katie Selby happening on March 20th, 7.30 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. in Brunix Hall, room 312. Um, that is the Design Your Life workshop, and you can register and le learn more at umnalumni.org slash designyourlife. We'll have more information about this as well towards the end of today's webinar. And if you're tuning in right now, you can also listen by phone at, and, that, and you can see it on your screen, there's some dial in options, as well as the information to enter the webinar ID. And I'd like to introduce our presenters. Sarah Wojcicki smith is the Assistant Director of Student Engagement at Carlson School of Management at the University of Minnesota. Sarah is an experienced professional who has worked at many colleges and universities across the Midwest, supporting, leading, and advocating for students and helping them find their voice and purpose. Our next presenter is Katie Selby. Katie Selby is, a, is an, a U of M alumna with a Master's of Education from the College of Education and Human Development. She has been coaching young professionals through career and life transitions for more than 20 years through her roles as a career coach, college recruiter, and leadership educator. Katie is a is founder and principal coach of Quarter Life Coach LLC, where she coaches her clients in their own life design. She previously served as director of student engagement and associate director of the undergraduate business career center at, at the Carlson School of Management. Now we're going to let get started and let our presenters take it away from here. All right. Thank you, Rebecca. And hello to everyone who's joining, joining us online. We are really excited to be here and to share the concepts of life design with all of our alumni friends. Um, so we'll get started and talk a little bit about um, some context. So Designing Your Life is a book written by Stanford design educators Bill Burnett and Dave Evans after more than 10 years of teaching courses in the Stanford Design School, both in product design and in life design. These authors found that students often came to their office hours with questions about career preparation, decisions about graduate school, and other big life questions, not just questions about their weekly class assignments. The authors developed a step-by-step -step process using the backbone of, of design thinking to apply to our own lives. The same design thinking responsible for new products and technology can be used to design and build your career and your life. They emphasize that you don't need to know your passion to design a life you love. This book has been a New York Times bestseller and has been popular at all stages of life, especially college to career, midlife, and those designing their encore careers into retirement. We'll tell you a little bit about our story and how we found designing your life. You'll see in our slides a few times or when we're speaking, we might say DYL and that to us means designing your life. So that's our only shorthand for you. Last year at the Carlson School undergraduate program, we were looking to build a new program to increase resiliency, reflection, and self-efficacy for our students and to help them reframe some dysfunctional beliefs about college and career success. We chose to build a comprehensive first year experience program for summer, from summer orientation through fall semester, 
all based on the book Designing Your Life. And last year, all first year students received the book and attended workshops to walk them through the life design process. Sarah and I spent four days at the Stanford D School last June with our faculty friend Steve Spruth, who's pictured in the photo on the right, learning about how to design our own lives and also how to apply these frameworks in higher ed. We joined a community of more than 130 universities around the world who are using Designing Your Life, along with many companies and other organizations. And today we're excited to share with you a sample of the methodology and invite you to participate in a bit of Designing Your Own Life, rather than just kicking back and checking your emails while we talk. So come along for the ride. We will start with um, just a little bit of overview. Oh, sorry. So design thinking is a really good approach to wicked problems. Uh, it's a great approach when you're looking at um, problems that don't have an easy to find answer and big ambiguous problems like what to do with my life, vocational wayfinding, uh, or education. So in des uh, when you apply it, uh, design thinking to our lives. We call it life design. You'll hear us say that as well throughout um, the, the presentation. So if we look at the process of design thinking, some of you may be familiar with this model that you've seen in the past. Uh, design thinking has been made famous by David Kelly, who's the founder of the Stanford D School and the product design firm IDEO. We're going to walk you through the steps and as we go through designing our own life today, we'll draw some parallels between this process, which is traditionally used in product design and our own life design. So the first step is empathize. The process starts with, an, with need finding, which is grounded in empathy, which literally means the ability to share feelings and perspectives of another person. In the case of product design, you're empathizing with the user and trying to understand what they may need. In the case of life design, the user is you. You need to empathize with where you are and where you might want to be. Next is define. Designers love problems. In design thinking, we put as much emphasis on problem finding as on problem solving. In defining the problem, it's all about scoping the shape and size and characteristics of the problem you're trying to solve. The third step is ideate. Designers love to ideate broadly and wildly. They love crazy ideas because they know the number one enemy of creativity is judgment. Designers use ideation techniques that help you get past your brain's tendency to be critical and leap into judgment. In ideation, we go for volume because you choose better when you have lots of good ideas to choose from. The fourth step is prototype. Once you've narrowed down some possible ideas, it's time to pick one and build a prototype. In product design, we are building our way forward, failing fast to learn and iterate and get the data we need for the next prototype. It's an iterative process where literally hundreds of prototypes can be made to get to the ideal solution. Life design prototypes are designed to ask a question and get some data about something you're interested in. Prototypes help you experience these alternatives without committing to a major life change. You can make a better decision about what you wanna pursue when you have more information. And the last step is test. When you have a prototype, you have to test it to see if it works. In product design, you take a prototype to the user, have them use the product and give you feedback. Once the user sees a rough version of the idea, they usually have some suggestions for improvement. When they have something to react to, they can envision how they will use it. And then we're back to refining our definition of the problem. In life design, the process is similar. A life design prototype could be coffee with a colleague, an internship, or volunteering in a field that you're interested in. This process might look linear on the slide, but it's an iterative one. We're building, testing, getting feedback, and iterating again. There's one more step that we add when we're doing life design, and that's the step of acceptance. As you ideate solutions, you may have to make more trade-offs or deal with constraints, like living near your family, or training for the Olympics, or dealing with an illness, and these are all about acceptance. We say you can't work on a problem that you're not willing to accept you have. Something else to consider about entering life design is design thinking mindsets. Designers have a different way of thinking that differ differentiates them. These five mindsets are how designers think differently and they're important to keep to the top of mind when considering designing your own life and warding off any dysfunctional beliefs. The first is radical collaboration. Design is a collaborative process and many of the best ideas are going to come from other people. What's radical is that you want a diverse team with different experiences, perspectives, and points of view. The second is reframing. Reframing is how designers get unstuck. 
Reframing enables designers to examine ways to look at problems differently or through a new lens in order to increase the opportunity for innovation. Reframing is also where we spend a lot of time with our students at the Carlson School, reframing some of their ideas about what success looks like in business school and what success may look like in their careers. Curiosity. We call this next step, uh, we, it is curiosity, we also call it just try stuff. <laughs> curiosity makes everything new, it invites exploration. It's an open approach to learning more. Designers look through the lens of curiosity, not judgment or rushing to a solution. You might hear designers say, tell me more, or ask open-ended questions to get at needs and wants, what works, what doesn't work, and what might be missing. The fourth step, or the fourth mindset, is being mindful of the process. Being aware of, the, of where you are in the design thinking process is important because it informs your approach. And it's important to be aware of your own process. Are you rushing to the solution? Are you blocked right now? Are you energized by certain activities and possibly drained by other activities? Being mindful of the process is key to the journey to product design and life design. And the last is the heart of design thinking, bias toward action. You are committed to build your way forward. Designers try things, they test out ideas, failing often until they find what works and what solves the problem. Designers embrace change. They are not attached to one particular outcome. So we'll start with empathize. In the case of product design, you are empathizing with the user and trying to understand what they may need. In the case of life design, the user is you. You need to empathize with where you are right now and where you might want to be in the future. In our first activity, we'd like you to be honest with yourself about your current state. Where are you now? Not where would you like to be in the future? The past is gone, the future is unknown for now. So the place to begin is simply where you are now. By embracing this philosophy, it's possible to let go of self-judgment and just get started. So come along for the ride. We'd like to invite you to try a life design activity called the dashboard. If any of you have read the book, Designing Your Life, this is, one of the, the, this is the very first activity that they engage us in. This helps you select which area of your life you'd like to take action on. We can't tackle everything all at once. So we're gonna ask you to take a look at the dashboard worksheet that Rebecca sent out uh, last week, I think it was on Friday, um, ahead of the workshop. And if you don't have the worksheet in front of you, we're gonna ask you to simply take out a piece of paper and write these four words down the side of the paper, work, play, love, and health, and then follow along. So we're gonna look at four discrete areas of our life that give us energy and provide focus. Again, work, play, love, and health. On the slide, I've listed the, def the definition of each of these areas of our life to help you focus, or I guess the definitions for this exercise. For instance, play is defined as whatever you do just for the joy of it, not for merit. And love is defined as all human relationships. And some of our audiences have pushed back and wanted to include four-legged beings as well in their love relationship. So that's up to you. Um, the top of the worksheet looks like four gauges that you might have on the dash of your car. We're gonna use this like your life dashboard to see how things are running currently. Please use your worksheet to shade in the gauges and you're simply going to, let's see, you're simply going to, I'll grab my mouse here, just shade in these areas between zero and full, taking a quick assessment of these four areas of your life. So how, how full is your work life? How full is your play life, etc. You may ask us what we mean by full, but that is totally up to you. So you're the expert on your own life, and we often would tell our students there's no wrong way to do this. So take a quick assessment for yourself. We're going to just give you about 90 seconds to fill out your gauges, don't overthink it, and assess your current state. So take a couple minutes. Actually, take 90 seconds. Also take a couple minutes to write in the lines below what's going on in each area of your life that may have led you to choose how full it was. So what's going on in your work? 
play, love, and health in the lines below your gauges. So now we're curious to know how you feel about these gauges once you filled them out. Make a few notes on your worksheet about your own reflection and feel free to share any thoughts or aha moments with us in the comment box. The first time that I read Designing Your Life was about three years ago and I was shocked by this activity because my play gauge seemed to be powered off. I had a very full work life with a job that I loved and a very full love life raising two boys at home. However, spending energy on something just for myself, just for joy, seemed like a totally foreign concept at the time. It was like a brick to the head, to be honest, to look at how play, how my play gauge was just non-existent. That aha moment for me prompted quite a bit of reflection about what play meant for me and how I could find more balance. Play for me used to be singing and baking, and that act this activity energized me to do more of those things in my life to have more balance. So we're gonna take a quick poll. We're really curious to know what you selected, which area of your life could use some action, improvement, or innovation. So Rebecca's gonna launch a poll for us and we're just gonna ask you to do a quick vote. Who chose which areas of your life? Work, play, love, or health? Which one could use some action? And we will share our results in just a minute. We're seeing lots of results come in and they're really, really balanced. It's fun to watch the numbers. Cool, all right. We can share the results. You are really balanced. So we had 34% of you say your work life could use some action improvement or innovation. And 34% of you said your play life, but really across the board, we were really balanced. So I like this activity for you to just take a look at where are you current state? A very simple way to start. Where could I use some, um, where do I define the problem? And then we're going to move on. So I'm going to pass it over to Sarah to talk about defining the problem. Hi all. Uh, so glad you're joining us today. So as Kitty said, we're going to move forward um, to the next step in design thinking, um, which is define. As Katie mentioned earlier, designers love problems. In design thinking, we really do put as much emphasis on problem finding as we do to problem solving. As we um, are defining the problem, we figure out where we can take action. And again, designers love taking action. So we will engage in some more reflection to better understand our potential problems to solve. The next activity is called energy mapping. Um, and this activity will allow us to take a look at our lives and assess what activities give us um, energy and which activities in our life take away energy. So I'm gonna give a quick overview on and show you an example of my energy map and then we'll have time for you to fill out your own energy map. So the first step in energy mapping is to list out your top energy giving and draining activities and engagements throughout the week. Um, so as I think about that, uh, things like student meetings, cooking, I recently bought a house, so lots of house projects that come up, spending time with family and friends, uh, trip planning, I love to travel, um, and of course the dreaded cleaning. Uh, <laughs> so here are the activities that I want to map out to see how much energy they give or drain me. The second step um, is really plotting what these look like um, for you. So you're going to draw a bar of each one of these activities um, and list how much energy positively or how much energy they take away from you negatively throughout your week. So when I look at my example here, a few things pop up, um, student meetings, cooking, things that give me energy, things um, like house projects or cleaning uh, drain my energy. 
The third step in energy mapping is just noticing, taking a moment to reflect on what, um, what does your map look like? What is it telling you? Um, are there any particular kinds of activities that are energy giving or draining? Again, for me, if I look at um, what my map tells me, three of the things that are really energy giving for me, so cooking, program cleaning, yoga, are all things that I do alone. I identify as an introvert, so that doesn't surprise me too much. Um, and another thing I notice, while I love teaching and working on teams, um, it can also be really draining for me to be around that large number of people. The final step in energy mapping is identifying a small or accessible change that you could make in your schedule to improve your energy flow. So again, designers are all about how do we take action. So for me, uh, an accessible change that I could make is breaking up large group activities that I do with solo work time so that I can recharge throughout the week. Um, and then I can also just build in uh, just having one night a week that's just for me um, so that I can, again, gain some energy um, to sustain all the other activities that I have to do throughout the week. So now I want you to create your own energy map. Um, again, this was another work, uh, worksheet that Rebecca sent out last week. So if you have that energy map worksheet, please pull it out and they have the steps listed there. Um, but if you don't have the, the worksheet, that's just fine. Take out a piece of paper and write down your list of top energy giving and draining activities. And just put a plus or minus if the energy or if the activity gives you energy or drains your energy. Energy. And I want to give you a few moments to do that. So you'll work through step one, which is just list your top energy giving and draining activities. Step two, identifying which ones um, give you energy as you plot them out. And then three and four, what are the things that you notice and um, what are the things that you could potentially change? So we're going to give you about two minutes um, to fill that out. And again, don't think about it too hard. Um, think about the things that come to mind for you um, throughout your week and identify if they give or drain you energy. So again, we'll give you about two minutes to do that. So I um, see some questions that are popping up about how um, it's mapped out. So I'll talk through that as you are identifying. So there are some activities that I have listed here that both give me energy occasionally, but also drain energy. So as I think about program planning, that's one in particular that um, it's kind of 50-50 at times. It can give me a lot of energy, especially when I'm, I'm working and I'm ideating on my own. Um, but when I think about the amount of program planning that I have to do, that can drain my energy um, along the way. I hope that's helpful. We'll give you about another minute or so, map out those activities. And again, you can move forward. Um, if you're finishing up in the chat box, you can share an insight that you have or an accessible change that you're considering. Again, my, my insights from my own map where um, all the things that I, um, or that give me energy are things that I do alone. I think that's helpful to know. Um, and then being around too many people can also be draining energy from me. So again, another minute or so, map that out and identify and notice any um, incremental changes that you can have.
All right. So I hope you uh, gain some insights from listing out your energy map. I think this is one of the life design activities that I go to regularly as I try to take um, kind of an insight onto um, what's happening in my life. If my schedule changes, this is a really great way to identify um, what that looks like. And thank you for those that are sharing um, ones that um, are noticing your changes and um, moving forward with that. That's great. And if I could just leave you with some takeaways about the um, energy map. Uh, mapping your energy gives you a better sense of your engagement. Um, for some of you, the sequ sequence as you are mapping um, might be particularly important. I think for me, there's definitely a correlation between energy, engagement, and meaning. And then you can use this awareness of flow and energy to design your life. It really gives you um, a sense to move forward as you are starting to design your life or redesign your life. Now we want to focus on what brings you alive. Uh, in life design, we talk about following what engages and excites you. And so we're going to move forward to that. The next um, part is focusing in on ideating. Um, so the, this is my favorite step of life design. It's where we can be curious um, and uh, really focus in on what designers like, um, looking at those problems and moving forward and ideating on those. Um, so I, um, so you just did some self-reflection, um, and I want to show you how you can ideate on those reflections moving forward. One way to ideate is by mind mapping. Some of you may have already um, been familiar with this practice, but mind mapping is a way to ideate by yourself. As we just identified, I really enjoy doing things by myself, so mind mapping works well for me. Um, mind mapping relies on visual semi-random word association to access the intuition that you have. It can be used to generate lots of different alternatives and to choose your best ideas, you want all of your ideas, which then will turn into positive action. Again, the designer mindset is all about um, kind of putting out all the ideas so that you can get your best ideas. We have a quote here that it's easier to tame down these wild ideas than think up. Um, and I think that is, uh, mind mapping is a great way to do that. So while we won't have time for you to build your own mind map today, I just wanna show you an example of how you could um, do this on your own time. It's fairly simple, but again, I think it shows you a lot of insights as you move forward. So I'm going to build my mind map off of something that I, I identified in my energy mapping um, that brings me lots of energy, which is trip planning and travel. So when I think of travel, my brain goes to personal travel, work travel, and volunteer opportunities. This is my finalized mind map. As you can see, it doesn't have to be pretty. It's really just for you. Again, there's no wrong way to do this. Um, it's just a way to get everything out of your mind and onto the page. So how we use mind mapping, um, it's to really leverage these different ideas that you come up with. So you wanna use elements of your map um, to find a wild idea. It's not enough just to write down um, all the things that come to top of mind, but how can you create a really wild and big idea um, to then move forward on? Uh, then once you have that wild idea, you want to extract any insights from that particular idea and what next steps could be taken to follow up on that insight. And again, I'll walk through my own personal example for you. So coming up with a wild idea, or as we like to talk about, mashups. So if I take what my mind map says and I wanna find maybe one or two wild ideas, I'll choose um, maybe leading a study abroad trip, designing your life, video, and reflection. That'll be my, my first idea. My second idea, we'll use volunteering, public health, nature, and coffee shops. So again, we're going to use these wild or use these ideas to come up with one wild idea. 
So here is what I came up with. Uh, my headline for the first idea is DYL Abroad Student DocuSeries. I want to utilize designing your life as a study abroad opportunity for the students that I work with to record their own experiences with life design and reflection. If I think about the second wild idea, uh, my headline is health educators drink coffee and solve world problems. Uh, I want to own my own coffee shop that helps folks interested in health education get connected with nature centered volunteer opportunities potentially abroad. And again, we, um, when we look at these ideas, they could seem fairly random. I chose a random sample from my mind map, um, but the point of mind mapping is to see how they're connected and get those insights. The next step is really getting those actionable steps. So as I think about my two wild ideas, designers have that bias towards action. So here are some ways that I can follow up on those wild ideas. I can capture the designing your life experience for students, find different ways to do that. I can connect with others who are doing life design abroad and there's folks that are doing that. I can create a promo video showcasing the power of reflection. For the health educators drink coffee and solve world problems, I could connect with health educators at a coffee shop to learn more from their experience. Maybe we'll take a walk, build in that nature aspect. And then my second one would be volunteer with a Minnesota-based global health organization. Those are just some ways that I can follow up on these wild ideas. All right, so we're gonna move back to our um, design thinking process and move on to prototyping. Sarah mentioned that ideate is her favorite step in the process where she gets to have wild ideas. And I'd have to say that prototyping is my, one of my favorite concepts in life design. It has really helped me and a lot of people I've worked with to redefine my own perspectives of fear and failure and keep moving forward. So in product design, we are building our way forward, failing fast to learn and, and iterate and get the data we need for the next prototype. Again, it's an iterative process where literally hundreds of prototypes can be made to get the ideal solution. Life design prototypes are designed to ask a question and get some data about something you're interested in. If you adopt the prototyping mindset, you'll have to accept that many things you try will not work out, but you will make improvements in your experience as you reflect on new learnings, build on things that are working and quickly dismiss those that are not. Proto prototyping helps us move into action. So why prototype? Why not just go all in, make a change? Fundamentally, this is about building our, our way forward. Given that you have a, number, a limited number of resources to spend, you want to spend them wisely. So by prototyping, you're able to expend a small number of resources to learn a lot. This then reduces risk. You've made a small investment up front, and depending on what you learn, you can decide to invest more with increased confidence as you go, or you can choose to invest in something else. Prototyping exposes ex assumptions also. You may have thought something was going to be one way and it turns out that it's not. Like you do an informational interview with a friend who works at a prestigious firm and you may learn that the culture there is not as rosy as you thought it might be. You spent a little bit of energy to learn a lot. Prototyping allows us to engage our ideas with others and get feedback. Getting life design feedback, especially from people who know you really well, is valuable for your future success. They may expose blind, blind spots that you might not be able to see. And my favorite selling point, prototyping is about sneaking up on the future. Prototypes help you experience these alternatives before you commit to a major life change so that you can make a better decision about what you want to pursue. Okay, so how do we do it? My slides are not moving forward. There we go. So how do we do it? A good prototype is all about return on, in, return on investment. You want maximum learning for minimum investment. So the best prototypes are inexpensive in terms of financial outlay. They're fast to implement, low time investment, and they're really accessible to you. In life design, we say that good prototypes cost you less than 20 bucks and less than two weeks, and they're easy to get started. Fundamentally, prototyping is about learning. 
So we like to think of life design prototypes in two buckets, conversations and experiences. Prototyping conversations are informational interviews, info sessions, things like that. We, um, we like to think of it as find someone who's living in your future and sneak up on it. Learn about their reality and see if it would really work for you. Prototyping experiences require you to live in a future reality for a brief period of time and see how you like it. Think about doing a job shadow, volunteering, or working in a part, working part time in a new career that you're considering, or engaging in some sort of online training to test your aptitude for some new required skills. Each of these experiences will test your assumptions about the new reality that you thought would be great. You can then reflect on what you've learned, build on the parts of your plan that are working well, and change or scrap those that are not. So let's take a look quick at uh, Sarah's process. If we look at Sarah's example of um, designing your life abroad student docu-series, she could get a clearer picture of what prototypes she could experiment with by doing a couple things. First, she could schedule a call with another university who is using life design. She could also ask a student who's studying abroad to try the designing your life framework with their experience and gather feedback. She could write a draft of the docu-series, or she could create a 60-second docu-series about one of her own trips to experiment with video production. Those are all things that could move her into action and be done in the next two weeks in order to move her plan forward. Just as a reminder, think about life design as an iterative process. Uh, life design asks you to involve others in your process, build on, build on the things that are working, or take small learning steps toward your goal. Reflect on each prototype, fail small, early, and often to succeed sooner, and learn about an experience before you make a major investment or a major life change. So as you think about areas of your life that you'd like to redesign, keep the design, these design thinking steps in mind. Consider that the career you designed for yourself maybe two years or five years or 20 years ago may no longer meet the needs of the market or the needs of the primary user who is you. This process helps us to introduce fresh idea ideas without judgment and gives us a roadmap about how to get going. Also remember the design thinking mindsets when you are feeling stuck. Ask yourself how you could engage others with your ideas or reframe a problem to see new possibilities. Uh, for those of you that want to engage more with life design, we want to invite you to de our Designing Your Life workshop. As Re Rebecca mentioned, we will be offering, Sarah and I will be offering Designing Your Life workshop through UMAA on Friday, March 20th on the Twin Cities campus, where we will dive much deeper into life design activities, including we're going to have you create a three parallel five-year plans for your life, and we'll also have you um, get feedback from other people about your prototyping plans and share ideas for other people's plans as well. I see this workshop as a gift of time to yourself to reflect, think big, and engage your ideas with others. This will certainly be a participatory, participatory workshop, so come ready to engage. If you're interested in joining us, please follow the link at the bottom of the slide to register. Also, if you're interested in learning more about designing your life resources in general, we wanted you to have these resources. So the first is the original book called Designing Your Life, a step-by-step -step guide to apply these tools in your life. Um, Dave Evans and Bill Burnett also have a new book that's being released one week from today, so this is excellent timing, called Designing Your Work Life. It's available for pre-order right now, but it's released next Tuesday, February 25th. If you are someone who likes to follow along prompts and kind of work through activities in a journal format, there is something called the Designing Your Life Workbook available that I have gifted to many, many friends and colleagues in my life. Um, and then designingyour.life is the website where you can find more workshops, tools, uh, social media connections, and also a blog where people are writing stories about, about their well-designed lives. So that's it for us. So now we wanna know what questions do you have or any comments that you have on how you think this could be useful to designing your own life. Please share them with us and we will do our best to answer questions. Yeah. 
We also have our contact info available if you would like to follow up with either one of us or ask any questions. You can find us both through email or through <coughs> LinkedIn. Um, we're having some questions coming in. Will we be providing the slides? A couple of people have asked if we'll provide the slides. And the answer is yes, Rebecca will send out the presentation. Oh, but not the slides. So we will we'll send out the presentation, including the audio and the uh, video will be available via YouTube link. It will be sent out after the presentation. Someone asked, can we please display the book recommendations again? We'll put them back on the screen so you can see what's available. But generally, if you do a search for designing your life, you can see what's out there. Some folks have mentioned um, how can you integrate life design into your daily life that it seems pretty big and we get this feedback in the work that we've done with students that it, it seems like something really big to take on but I think what's important to remember is the designer mindsets and it's all about starting small and prototyping and that's why most of the activities that we did today and that we'll do at the workshop will be how can you take one or two small things away from here and continue to implement them in your life um, and reflect on them. I think this life design mo model just really helps you take a pause and reflect on where your life is going and what you're interested in. Um, and then you can make small changes from that. I think uh, if you have others that are interested in this work, building a community also helps you engage in this work more daily. Um, and they can help hold you accountable to the things that you want to prototype or the different ideas that you have. Somebody's asking, would it be useful to work on designing your life with your partner? And so um, about doing this work with your husband, I think it would be really interesting to do it alone, like individually and then share your results, especially as we're gonna work on uh, designing your five-year plans in our workshop that may be something interesting to do together to look at future um, possibilities for your lives and just get out of the, out of the notion that there's one right way to do everything and get into those wild ideas and brainstorming about what could the future look like and what could you create together. Uh, what's one example of a small change you can make best based on the activities? We've seen a lot of people make a lot of small changes in their lives based on how they spend their time or their energy. Um, one energy suck that we hear from people quite a bit is their commute back and forth to work. And so people will say things like, I could listen to audiobooks on my commute, or I could talk to a friend on my commute if those relationships are suffering. Um, so those are a couple examples, but we've, sure, we've certainly seen a lot of people make a lot of small, process, small changes, including maybe what time they get up in the morning or spending time by yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, one of our colleagues decided to start holding an hour at the end of her day in the afternoon for email and administration time because she was feeling overwhelmed by that and she was planning it in her day um, to make that more manageable. So there are a lot of small things that you can do, um, small changes you can make to preserve some of your energy. Somebody has a question about mind mapping process and how you start and engage with that. And really what I love about mind mapping is that you can do it at any point. Any white piece of paper that you have, it really is just a way to brainstorm. And like I said, a way to brainstorm by yourself. I think the process that we walk through today is how do you take what ideas you have on the piece of paper and make something come from it. But really for me, it's a nice reflection point to say, okay, how, how am I, uh, if I take a, t a particular topic, how are these things connected or how can I expand ideas past this? It's about being curious and seeing where your mind takes you and then being able to pull some of those things together. I also think doing the mind map alone and then working with somebody else and talking through it can also help you kind of find insights that you may not have already um, seen yourself. Someone also asked if we covered the test stage and for me the test stage is um, the what you learn from your prototypes. So you you come up with prototypes and you test them. You see if they if you like them you see if they work see if you want to move in that direction further or if you'd like to kind of scrap it and move on. Let's see. So I would say for many of you you're asking um, deeper questions about the activities in the book or, or um, how you can apply this. I would, of course, I would recommend purchasing the book um, or purchasing the workbook, whatever works for you. And there's a quite a lot of information online of people who are doing really great things in this um, framework and mindset. All right, well, thank you, Katie and Sarah, for this great webinar today on Designing Your Life. I feel like I definitely learned a lot in terms of energy levels and things on my own personal dashboard, and I'm sure 
many of our viewers also took away a lot from today's presentation. And we look forward to um, many of you possibly joining us, joining us on March 20th at the in-person uh, Design Your Life workshop here on campus at the University of Minnesota in Brunix. And you can find the information on our website um, if you go to umnalumni.org. Thank you and have a great day.